In November 1918, after four terrible years, Britain finally emerged victorious from the Great War. Bells sounded, bands paraded, and cheering crowds of soldiers and civilians descended on Buckingham Palace. But in one corner of the United Kingdom, the celebrations were less enthusiastic. It was less certain that good had prevailed over evil. And there, they were preparing for a fight. I will investigate that history through British documents. To the rebels, the enemy files, penned by the king and by the prime minister and his mistress, by generals and foot soldiers. And they reveal the frustration of the United Kingdom, recently victorious in a world war, one of the few European empires to survive, now worn down by a foe that would not play by the rules, that murdered men at the church door and in their beds, and yet won the propaganda war, which perhaps caused the British commander-in-chief in Ireland to explode. I loathe the country and its people with a depth deeper than the sea, and more violent than that I feel for the Bosch. The General Post Office in Dublin was still a ruin. The rebel leaders had been shot and their bodies tossed into lime pits. The Easter Rising, another Irish rebellion, had been crushed with military might in just a few days. And Britain had returned to the business of defeating the Germans. But those fateful days in April 1916 had changed Ireland forever. Much of the island simmered with resentment. The moderate nationalists fighting for home rule were soundly rejected at the ballot box in 1918, and the Irish volunteers of the Easter Rising re-emerged as the IRA. The British government was caught unawares on whether to make war or peace, to engage in reprisals or negotiations. The British were split between hawks and doves. As a British Member of Parliament, a Thatcherite who lost several political friends murdered by the IRA during the Troubles, I was a hawk. But later, as Secretary of State for Defence, politically accountable for those soldiers who were killed in Northern Ireland, and a member of the key Cabinet Committee, I became a dove and agreed to opening talks with the Provost. And from that perspective, I'm interested in how 100 years ago, the British government lost faith in its ability to win the war in Ireland and decided instead to offer limited concessions to the Irish in order to obtain peace. How the hawks became doves. The British general election of 1918 had been called immediately after the armistice with Germany. The governing coalition won an overwhelming victory and the Liberal Party Prime Minister David Lloyd George remained in place. Ever since the wartime coalition between the Conservative and Liberal parties had been forged back in 1915, Ireland had seemed the likeliest issue to tear it apart. But with the election out of the way, the Irish question was put on the back burner, since Lloyd George's priority was the European Treaty. On the 18th of January 1919, the victorious nations from the First World War began a long conference here at Versailles, designed to punish Germany and to rework the map of nations. The Welsh Liberal, David Lloyd George, who'd been in high office since 1905 and now led a British coalition dominated by Conservatives, felt that he must dominate that discussion. And so, in a way that seems unbelievable today, the British Prime Minister established himself here in France and made only infrequent visits to London as hostilities in Ireland escalated. Lloyd George continued to suspend the normal procedures of cabinet government during the peace conference. The war cabinet was kept in place until it was over, 
It met occasionally in London, but policy making on Ireland, as on everything else, was halted during the Prime Minister's absence. Morris, as an indicator of Lloyd George's frame of mind, here's a note from uh, Morris Hankey, the Cabinet Secretary, just before the Versailles Conference opens. Lloyd George has brought the country through the war, but is in a nervous, irritable and difficult frame of mind. The mistake he's making is to try and absorb too much into his own hands. He seems to have a sort of lust for power, ignores his colleagues or tolerates them in an almost disdainful way and seems more and more to assume the attitude of a dictator. How do you feel the British government was being run in this period when Lloyd George is about to come to Versailles? Well, he's, he's trying to run it all himself and that continues when he gets to Versailles. He delegates domestic affairs to Boner Law, who's the virtual deputy prime minister. And Boner Law flies out to uh, Paris occasionally to consult with Lloyd George and then flies back home again, donning a fur-lined flying suit, a bit like um, Henry Kissinger before his time. And uh, he's meant to deal with all the domestic stuff, the labor unrest, Ireland. And Lloyd George is consumed by reordering the world here in Versailles. Another matter. Uh, Versailles begins with some of the principles of Woodrow Wilson, which indicate a sympathy for the aspirations of the nations of Europe. Now, Irish nationalists see an opportunity there, do they not? Do they come knocking at the glass of the Hall of Mirrors? Very much so. The end of the war has really changed the whole calculus for Irish nationalists. And so the Irish come here hoping to at least interest, certainly interest Woodrow Wilson in pressing their cause. Ho Chi Minh is here to press Vietnam's case and he meets the Irish delegation and they're both very much on the margins. They realise that they're not getting anywhere and Sean T. O'Kelly, who is leader of the Irish delegation here, confides to an American journalist that all the other races are getting a hearing here. The browns, the blacks, the yellows, but not the Irish. So perhaps then, uh, as Britain goes on to fight not only a war in Ireland, but a propaganda war in Ireland, the background of Versailles, maybe that is part of the embarrassment for the British as they fight the war. Yes, because Britain fought the First World War um, for civilization against the barbarism of the Germans. So the whole atmosphere that emanates from this peace conference here in Versailles, the atmosphere which makes uh, imperialism look uh, very much like yesterday's idea, which makes nationhood and nationality um, now the key driver of what the new world order should be. What's going on in Ireland looks to be very much at odds with the message that came from here. So events in Ireland prove a poor reflection for the British. Perfect. Lloyd George believed that Ireland was a problem for another day. But while the Prime Minister basked in the splendour of Versailles, surrounded by his fellow world leaders, Britain's day of reckoning in Ireland had already arrived. On January the 21st, 1919, shots were fired at Solohead Beg in County Tipperary, now considered to be the opening gunfire of the War of Independence. Constables Patrick O'Connell and a father of seven, James MacDonald, were escorting a horse-drawn cart carrying gelignite for blasting at a local quarry from Tipperary military barracks. A group of masked men of the IRA's 3rd Tipperary Brigade, which included Dan Breen, lay in wait behind a roadside fence near the quarry. The volunteers appeared with guns drawn and called on the Royal Irish Constabulary officers to surrender. The policemen took up firing positions and were immediately shot and killed. The killings were a shock, and not just to the British. The two dead officers were popular men, Catholics both, one an Irish speaker. The government quickly offered an enormous reward and issued this wanted poster for Daniel Breen who calls himself Commandant of the 3rd Tipperary Brigade. It must have hoped that public revulsion, at least misgivings, would quickly bring him to justice. <laughs> 
But the drama of this fateful day was not at an end. As military vehicles scoured these country roads looking for Dan Breen and his accomplices, back in Dublin, newly elected Sinn Féin MPs convened the first Doyle and proclaimed the establishment of an independent Irish Republic. On the 21st of January, 1919, 28 Sinn Féiners, duly elected to the British Parliament, decided instead to declare themselves members of an Irish Doyle here in Dublin's magnificent Mansion House. Their numbers would have been more than double had 34 of them not been in jail and another three deported. The Lord Lieutenant of Ireland, Field Marshal John French, remarked that they would troop off to Westminster as soon as they discovered that they could not draw their salaries. With political intelligence, I use the word in both senses of that quality, French and his good friend Walter Long governed Ireland as hawks. Margaret, hello. hello Michael. This photograph of the first Doyle mesmerises me. I mean, it looks like it's a parliament that's been sitting for a century. Tell me about the photo. Well, it's an amazing feat of organisation, and it's really saying, yes, this is it, we're no longer going to Westminster. And I suppose it can be seen as the desire of those elected to proclaim to the world that this is the Parliament of the Irish Republic. It's such a statement to the world. But in the eyes of Dublin Castle, it's ridiculous. At a time when the Prime Minister and the majority of his cabinet were far too distracted to consider Ireland, the documents reveal how Britain's hardline approach was dictated by a dyed-in-the-wool unionist, Walter Long, the first Lord of the Admiralty. Uh, Walter Long, in November 1918, has written a memo about the situation in Ireland. He says, the Lord Lieutenant has appointed an executive council composed of representative Irishmen. And it's proposed to bring in a short bill so that it would become a sort of cabinet for the government of Ireland. What do you think of that idea? Long is operating out of a time frame of 10 years earlier, if you like, when people talked about castle reform and the necessity of having more representative Irish people. Their day is gone. It's, it's, it's delusional. The British government regarded Walter Long as their Irish expert. Well, Walter Long's a very strange character, really. He's made himself the voice of Irish unionism. He got elected for South County Dublin when he lost his English seat. So he knew Irish unionists intimately on the ground. And he's given quite a lot of leeway by Lloyd George because Lloyd George is obviously dealing with a coalition government and Long is an important figure for fundamentalist loyalism and unionism in that context. On the morning of the 20th of May 1919, Walter Long was aboard the Admiralty yacht Enchantress as it moored at Dunleary. The vessel served as his mobile headquarters during his governance of Ireland. Without disembarking, Long invited on board the Lord Lieutenant Sir John French, French's private secretary Somerset Saunderson, and the Chief Secretary for Ireland, Ian McPherson. These were the Hawks meeting to mastermind the destruction of Sinn Féin. Now uh, here's a, a minute, 24th of June 1919. Uh -huh. uh, Lord French is the author. The Irish government is now forced to conclude that Sinn Féiners in that district are an organised club for murder of police and the time has come when Sinn Féin and its organisation in this part of Tipperary must be proclaimed an illegal association. What they're thinking behind that is, if they make these areas uncomfortable, the population will turn against what they see as these unrepresentative perpetrators of evil acts. They think it's going to alienate the population, but actually it does alienate the population, but not necessarily against the perpetrators of the crimes, but perhaps against the government. I'm slightly surprised to find here that Bonalore was not enthusiastic for the proclamation 
He says here to proclaim Sinn Féin means, in effect, putting an end to the whole political life of Southern Ireland. And we should find that it could not be effectively done. Yours sincerely, A. Bona Law. Well, Bona Law is a highly intelligent man. Yes, he's a committed unionist, but like others, he's beginning to think the game has changed because these Sinn Féiners are elected representatives. Now, Bonner Law is enough of a democratic politician to recognise that if you completely repress and declare illegal the only electoral representation of a whole people, you're in big trouble. The Doyle hadn't authorised any armed action, but it certainly lent legitimacy to the IRA in the campaign that followed. The Royal Irish Constabulary were early targets in a campaign of attacks against police stations, especially those that were rural and remote. The IRA then turned its attention to soldiers. On Sunday the 7th of September 1919, an armed party of the King's Shropshire Light Infantry marched to Sunday service at the Wesleyan Church in the town of Fermoy, County Cork in the first organised Irish action against British military forces since the Easter Rising, 25 volunteers from Fomoy Company, armed with just six revolvers, ambushed the soldiers. The company's leader, Liam Lynch, called on the British soldiers to surrender and hand over their arms. They refused. A firefight left Private William Jones dead and three more soldiers wounded. Lynch and his party disappeared into the surrounding countryside. The local coroner's jury failed to return a verdict of murder on the grounds that the ambushers' aim had been to seize arms rather than to kill. Enraged British troops responded by running amok, smashing shop windows in Fomoy's main streets. With British reprisals, a new cycle of violence in Ireland had been born. Many worse examples were to follow. Lieutenant Colonel Hughes Hallett regarded the shooting of soldiers as they entered church as a damned dirty trick, as he wrote in his diary. And although he told his men after their rampage that enough was enough and confined them to barracks, he did not condemn or punish their indiscriminate reprisals. And so the British Army sacrificed its key military assets, its discipline, prestige and legitimacy, alienating supporters and recruiting new opponents. The attacks in Fermoy coincided with Lloyd George's return from Versailles. The Irish question could wait no longer. The Home Rule Act of 1914, which had been postponed for the duration of the Great War, provided self-government for all of Ireland. But now there was pressure to remove Ulster from the arrangement. The only way to square the circle was to divide Ireland, to partition it north from south. Whilst no member of the coalition could contemplate independence for nationalist Ireland, it was the need to insulate Ulster from the south that really aroused conservative and unionist passions. Fergal, the committee chaired by Walter Long uh, produces a report in November 1919 with a number of options, one of which is to establish one parliament for the three southern provinces and a second parliament for Ulster. This is not so very distant from what emerges in the Government of Ireland Bill and Act of the following year. It is pretty close to the act as produced, but I think you need to look a little bit more closely at what it's spelling out and how realistic those proposals are. So it's spelling out that there should be a northern and a southern parliament, um, but it's very unlikely that there's going to be anyone who's going to work that southern parliament. So it's really about um, setting up a northern parliament, and that means setting up a northern state. For Britain, Ireland is just such a difficult, time-consuming, troublesome 
question. It's broken government after government. So this is very attractive because in a sense there's a kind of a washing of, of uh, British hands for responsibility for what happens in the future. For Ulster Unionists, though, it's also quite attractive. This not only sets up uh, a Northern Ireland state, but it gives Ulster Unionists an independence, not just from the south, but actually also from London. The nature of the Northern Ireland that's going to emerge is also discussed by the Cabinet. And uh, this, I think, is in December 1919. The Ulster leaders had confirmed that they were doubtful whether the Northern Parliament of Ireland would be able effectively to govern the Ulster counties where there was a nationalist majority and preferred that the scheme should be applied only to the six Protestant counties. Um, unusual in history, this, a, a, a kind of new state choosing to be smaller than it could be. The problem with a nine-county Ulster was that it would be, you know, reasonably closely balanced in terms of its Catholic Protestant composition, and there was a concern that the Catholic uh, uh, minority might overwhelm the, the Protestant majority and, and destabilise uh, the, the settlement. The other likely option, um, which had been mooted previously, was that each county would vote, and that would have most likely led to a four-county Ulster because Fermanagh and Tyrone had nationalist majorities. And the fear here, which was, I think, shared by Unionists and Tories, was that a state that was only four counties would be essentially too small to um, survive. As the British government debated the future of Northern Ireland, former Conservative Prime Minister Arthur Balfour, who'd opposed Irish Home Rule, launched an assault on those questioning Ulster's right to remain a fully integrated part of the United Kingdom. Arthur Balfour issues a critique of emerging government policy. The Cabinet are aware that, in my opinion, the only really workmanlike alternative to preserving the Union is an excision from it of the south and west of Ireland. Balfour concludes his minute with this thought. People ignore the fact that such unity as Ireland possesses is mainly the work of England, that she has never in all the centuries been a single organised independent state, and that if she were not surrounded by water, no human being would ever think of forcing the loyal and Protestant North into the same political mould as the disloyal and Roman Catholic South. Balfour is essentially saying that the UK shouldn't be neutral. So it shows how close is the sort of the, the, the political perspectives, I suppose, of the British government who are supposed to be, in a sense, objectively framing the legislation and resolving a dispute between nationalists and unions. It shows how close their uh, fundamental political positions are to those of Ulster unionists. As the British government concentrated on Ulster, the IRA's campaign intensified. One of the most audacious operations took place on Friday the 19th of December 1919 at Ashdown on the northern fringe of Dublin's Phoenix Park. The Lord Lieutenant in Ireland, Field Marshal Sir John French, was travelling in an armoured convoy towards his home in the Vice Regal Lodge. Volunteers were waiting at Kelly's Halfway House pub and concentrated their gunfire and grenades on the convoy's second car in which French had been due to travel. But he was in the lead vehicle and escaped injury. The Chief Secretary for Ireland was appalled by Lloyd George's reaction to the murderous attack. There was no expression of regret or sympathy for us in our difficult task. He simply said, they're bad shots. Well, what did he expect? The Prime Minister had been toughened by winning a world war. On General French himself, it dawned, we're up against a powerful conspiracy, something more than the scallywags we thought. But even so, no appreciation of how widespread might be the public support for such violence. The assassination attempt on the Lord Lieutenant served only to harden the resolve of the Hawks in Dublin and London and the Prime Minister was obliged publicly to support whatever the hardliners deemed necessary to crush the campaign of crime and outrage. As 1919 came to its violent close, the British government prided itself on having both a security and a political strategy.
it would set up a parliament in Northern Ireland to reassure the Unionists in Great Britain and Ulster, and a parliament in the South that would satisfy at least moderate nationalist sentiment. They hoped. Richard. Hello. Hi. Wonderful surroundings. Yes, indeed. Now, I've got a letter here from Walter Long. It's dated Boxing Day 1919. It's to the Prime Minister. He's concerned that the new Government of Ireland bill may be regarded as mere window dressing, advocating a double-barrelled policy of the firm repression of crime and constitutional reform. Is Long on the right track? I think the problem with the two barrels approach is that both barrels are blocked, probably. The first problem with the policy is that it's really not an issue for people who voted for the 73 Sinn Féin MPs. This bill is devolution within the United Kingdom, but the people who voted for Sinn Féin want a republic, a 32-county independent sovereign state. On the military side, the view that they are fighting a crime wave is problematic because what they're actually fighting is the Irish Republican Army, which conceives of itself as a people's army uh, and as a military force. So they don't understand that they're fighting people who think themselves to be in a war situation. General Shaw, who at the time is the Commander-in-Chief in Ireland, reports in March 1920, the Irish Volunteers have a very powerful organisation which can only be crippled through its leaders. By concentrating every effort and all our resources against those leaders, the organisation can and will be broken. Sound? This overlooks the very recent lesson of history from the Easter Rising in 1916, when the British government had pursued exactly the same strategy of executing the leaders. But other people, like Michael Collins, who are fairly minor figures, relatively speaking, during the Easter Rising, step into their place. Uh, and a policy of decapitation uh, is not one that is going to work. But was this because, really, the British government uh, could not admit that it was at war? It couldn't give that status to the enemy? Or was it a genuine misunderstanding? It is partly the case that the British government can't admit that there's a war going on in part of the United Kingdom. So, mentally, you can see how they have to deal with it as a process of criminal actions. However, there are people in the British government uh, and in the British establishment and the British military who are starting to realise uh, that it is more than that. One key difference from the pre-First World War period and the period we're talking about is the attitude of the Unionists. This is from the House of Commons, 29th of March, 1920. Captain Craig, speaking for the Unionists, uh, says, we feel that an Ulster without a parliament of its own would not be in nearly as strong a position as one in which a parliament had been set up, where the executive had been appointed, and where, above all, the paraphernalia of government was already in existence. We see our safety, therefore, in having a parliament of our own. A big change. It is a huge change, and it's the first recognition in British legislation of the mindset of Ulster Unionists, who, for all their desire to remain part of the uh, United Kingdom, are profoundly distrustful of governments in London. And so, although they had resisted home rule, uh, partition and the establishment of a home rule parliament uh, in Belfast, just covering the six counties of Northern Ireland, does give them a sense of security. As the Government of Ireland bill dragged its way through Parliament, Britain's security policy was in disarray. The IRA carried out a series of daylight assassinations. On the morning of the 26th of March 1920, former resident magistrate Alan Bell who'd been tasked by the British government with tracking down Sinn Féin funds, followed his regular routine by taking the tram to Dublin Castle from his home at Salt Hill. When it paused at a busy crossing, 
half a dozen passengers dragged Bell off and bundled him down a side street. Five shots rang out, and he dropped down dead. As Bonalore was to tell Parliament, the passengers on the tram were paralyzed with horror and did nothing to interfere. Bell was dragged into the street and shot in the head. Then, according to Bonalore, the assassins ran off. Officials working for the British government could no longer feel safe living in a house like one of these. Civil servants and their families were ordered into Dublin Castle where British authority in Ireland was now effectively in a state of siege. There was now a growing realisation within both Dublin Castle and the Cabinet Office in London that this was war. And yet, British policy continued to treat the IRA not as adversaries, but as criminals. The Prime Minister Lloyd George believed that fighting the insurgency was principally a policeman's job, and the government decided to recruit a special emergency gendarmerie using war veterans. Here on the platform at Limerick Junction, the attire of the new officers reminded a journalist of the beagles of the Scartine Hunt, which are black and tan, and so was nicknamed the Force, whose brutality was enough to bring severe embarrassment to the British government, but never quite sufficient to crush the IRA or its support amongst the Irish public. The cycle of insurgency and reprisal intensified, nowhere more so than in the IRA's heartland in Munster. So a new, more hardline RIC divisional commissioner was drafted into the province. Lieutenant Colonel Gerald Smythe had served with distinction in the Great War, been wounded six times, and had lost his left arm. At a meeting in Listowel, County Kerry, on the 19th of June, 1920, Smythe reportedly told RIC officers, should the order hands up not be immediately obeyed, shoot and shoot with effect. If the persons approaching a patrol carry their hands in their pockets or are in any way suspicious looking, shoot them down. You may make mistakes occasionally, and innocent persons may be shot, but that cannot be helped, and you're bound to get the right party sometime. The more you shoot, the better I will like you. And I assure you, no policeman will get into trouble for shooting any man. Hunger strikers will be allowed to die in jail, the more the merrier. Some of them have died already, and a damn bad job they were not all allowed to die. His reported speech, alarmed Dublin Castle, was debated in the House of Commons and made Smythe the marked man. On the evening of the 17th of July, 1920, he was shot dead at an exclusive social club in Cork by a six-man RA team. The escalating violence led to another recruitment initiative in July 1920 and the further militarization of the police. The Auxiliary Division was created from former military officers who wore distinctive tam caps and operated in counter-insurgency units independent of other RIC formations. The idea of expanding the beleaguered Royal Irish Constabulary by recruiting a special force of volunteer British ex-servicemen had first been mooted by the Army Commander-in-Chief in Ireland, Sir Frederick Shaw. But Shaw was fired before the first Black and Tans arrived, and his replacement was General Neville Macready, who hated Ireland and the Irish. But at least he was impartial when it came to the political divide. He readily admitted to loathing unionists and nationalists in equal measure. Dublin Castle had been the seat of English and later British power for more than 700 years. The cabinet relied on its so-called government of Ireland, its Lord Lieutenant, its Chief Secretary, its civil servants, 
for policy advice. When General Neville Macready became the Commander-in-Chief in Ireland in April 1920, he was flabbergasted by the administrative chaos. And as regards the Royal Irish Constabulary, he wrote, we are sitting on a volcano. The personnel changes that would follow would improve the administration and redirect policy. Dublin Castle was a notoriously chaotic administration. More than 36 departments of government, each of them really independent of each other, uh, many of them jealous of each other, um, vying for, for attention, for funding, uh, contradicting each other very often. By the time of McCready arrives, there are three significant figures in the Irish administration. One is the Lord Lieutenant, who should be largely ceremonial, but under John French had become quite a powerful figure. The Chief Secretary, who uh, is Macpherson, but he spends most of his time in London, in the Cabinet. And the Under Secretary, who is actually running the show in Dublin, and is really in charge of everything. Warren Fisher, a top civil servant working to the Chancellor of the Exchequer, is appointed to look into things. And uh, he says, the castle administration does not administer. On the mechanical side, it can never have been good and is now quite obsolete. With the notable exception of General Macready, the government of Ireland strikes one as almost woodenly stupid and quite devoid of imagination. It listens solely to the ascendancy party. It never seemed to think of the utility of keeping in close touch with opinions of all kind. The phrase Sinn Féin is a shibboleth with which everyone not a loyalist is denounced. I've, uh, in my experience of government, never read such hard-hitting words written by a civil servant as Warren Fisher writes, woodenly stupid. What personnel changes followed Warren Fisher's report? What then happened was these figures were, were basically pensioned off and a group that um, was described within the castle as the junta, arrived, a group of key civil servants, and they began to uh, fulfill that key function, not only of administration, but also of, uh, of advising and, and testing opinion and, and uh, making contact with the full range of Irish opinion. The hawks in Dublin Castle were routed and replaced by new men like Andy Cope, Sir John Anderson and Mark Sturgis. And they ushered in a dramatic change in attitude and policy. The personnel changes that occur around 1920 here in the castle, how important are they to the outcome of the war? I think they are crucial to the outcome. One of the recommendations that Warden Fisher makes is to abolish the Lord Lieutenancy as a position, which means also abolishing John French as Lord Lieutenant. And you begin to see, uh, under John Anderson, a political analysis beginning to develop, which begins to feed back into the cabinet. The mystery is why I think Lloyd George delays so long, because quite clearly what Sinn Féin wants is, is not anarchy. You know, what they want is government, but they want to be the government. This is statecraft that's required, not simply suppressing, you know, cattle raiding. Um, and it's that, that analysis is now embedded in Dublin Castle. The analysis might have changed, but the cycle of violence and retaliation continued to escalate. Attacks by the IRA on Crown forces were followed by British reprisals. The sack of Balbriggan in North County Dublin sparked widespread condemnation. On September the 20th, 1920, IRA volunteers had shot dead RIC Head Constable Peter Burke. The Black and Tans and Auxiliaries descended on Balbriggan, intent on revenge. They smashed shop windows, set fire to a hosiery factory and destroyed 25 houses, forcing families to take refuge in the fields nearby. Two local young men, Seamus Lawless and Sean Gibbons, were beaten to death by the Tans. Senior official at Dublin Castle, Mark Sturgis, wrote in his diary, worse things happen than the firing up 
of a sink like Balbriggan. And the Commander-in-Chief of the Army in Ireland, General McCready, reported, where reprisals have taken place, the whole atmosphere of the surrounding district has changed from hostility to cringing submission. Vengeance was evidently condoned at the highest level, but it caused outrage in the United States and in Parliament and misgivings in the Cabinet. In truth, the tide was turning against the Hawks. Days after the sack of Balbriggan, General McCready advised the Cabinet that there had been an increase in IRA casualties and that army and police morale in Ireland had improved. But he also warned that this might make the extremists feel that desperate measures are necessary. We may therefore expect to see a temporary increase of murder and outrage. On the morning of the 21st of November 1920, the General's prognosis came to pass, and British intelligence officers were picked off by Michael Collins's squad in their Dublin lodgings. Captain Jern was one of the few British intelligence officers to survive because he was out on a night operation. He wrote, on getting back, I found the body of my friend Chummy Darling lying full length on the floor in the doorway of the bathroom Price's body. Murray had been taken to hospital. Colonel Woodcock, shot three times, survived. Likewise, Captain Keenly side. Colonel Montgomery had been shot on the stairs. Ames and Bennett were murdered in their beds. Two officers at the Gresham Hotel were also dead. Whether you regard slaying sleeping soldiers as glorious or villainous depends on your perspective. The important thing for history is the political consequence. On Bloody Sunday, first blood was drawn on the grand streets and squares of Georgian South Dublin. It was a startling event. They roused many of them from their beds, shot men climbing through the windows of their rooms, in front of their wives, within the hearing of some of their children uh, on that morning. It shocked Ireland, and indeed it shocked Britain when news uh, you know, spread of it. Well, what do you make of the timing of the IRA operation to kill all these British intelligence officers here in Dublin? Well, I don't think there's any doubt, but the timing is a direct response to the developments in Ireland over the preceding months. There was a policy of toleration of reprisal uh, under the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act from August. There'd been increased use of court martials an increasingly hard line had been taken with prisoners, for instance, around hunger strikes, and Terence McSweeney had recently died in prison on hunger strike, and executions had resumed for the first time since the 1916 Rising, and also was increased intelligence operations. Here's a letter to Bona Law. It's from Hamer Greenwood, the Chief Secretary, 25th of September 1920. The tide has turned in Ireland. The hostiles are getting frightened. At long last, the mass of Irishmen are losing faith in Sinn Féin as a winning side. It's typical of Greenwood's position at this point. Greenwood had arrived in Ireland in the spring uh, holding quite moderate views, but over the summer he'd become the face of, and not just the face of, the proponent of a policy of coercion in Ireland. You know, his analysis was deeply flawed. When he was writing to Bonner Law, he was writing to a receptive audience. Bonner Law also believed in a hawk, the pursuit of a hawkish policy in Ireland and was one of those along with Churchill and Walter Long who wanted to see a policy of coercion in Ireland and thought it would be effective. Bloody Sunday has a morning and an afternoon. Yeah. Tell me what you think happens in the afternoon. Some of those on the Irish nationalist side see it as a, as a direct reprisal, a, a deliberate response to the morning's activities. Um, it's probably a bit more subtle than that. There seems to have been a plan, even before the morning's events, to raid this match at Croke Park, which was a game of Gaelic football between Dublin and Tipperary, uh, in aid of a prisoner support organisation. The raid seems to have been premised on the idea that this kind of event would be a place where you'd be quite likely to see some activists. The morning's events, though, do certainly affect the atmosphere in which the raid takes place. 
the black and tans and the auxiliaries arrived to conduct the actual searches. They claimed in the aftermath that shots were fired from inside the stadium. Most historians would agree this is probably highly unlikely and that in actual fact what happened is that the black and tans initially began to fire into the stadium and then ran into the stadium firing. But what's certain is that uh, 14 people were killed, one player who was uh, Michael Hogan who played on the Tipperary team and then 11 civilians, three of them young boys, one a woman and, and, and the rest, you know, adult males. What about the effect on the British government? How do you think the events of the whole day affect the balance of hawks and doves in the British government? It reinforces uh, probably for some of the figures on either side their views. Uh, you know, it's proof for the Hawks of the, uh, you know, the, the dangerous nature of this Irish re rebellion and it needs the fact that it needs to be put down and shut down. Um, for people who are uh, less hawkish, it proves that this perhaps proves or indicates the strategy isn't working. Bloody Sunday was a disaster for the British government. Its intelligence effort was smashed and the massacre in the afternoon caused further international outrage. We had to wait 83 years for the conclusions of a secret inquiry into the killings at Croke Park to be made public. I'd like to know whether Bloody Sunday was the major setback that it seemed, maybe a turning point. Brian, tell me about this very imposing building that we've come into. Well, this, in 1920, was headquarters of Irish command of the British military in Dublin. And it was here that the secret inquiry into the events of Bloody Sunday took place. And they did add something to the sum of our knowledge, did they? Yes, they certainly did. I mean, they showed, in many ways, the confusion um, that reigned on the day, the range of emotions from the auxiliaries, perhaps seeking revenge for two of their comrades who'd been killed that morning. And some of the policemen, the Dublin policemen interviewed, essentially argued that they hadn't heard any firing before. So this contradicted the official version, which had been that the auxiliaries and the police had responded to fire from the IRA. On the morning of Bloody Sunday, intelligence officers are killed. So how great is the blow to British intelligence in Ireland? I think psychologically to the British public opinion and the British political establishment, it's a huge blow. Officers cut down at home and then the idea is that Ireland is clearly not under control. This situation is actually escalating. It seems that on Bloody Sunday, three things happen as far as the British are concerned. It's now hard to argue that the war is about to end. The afternoon's events are a public relations disaster and the morning's events probably cripple the intelligence effort. Should it be seen then as a turning point? It certainly is a turning point in many ways because even though the effects are contradictory, the IRA are actually put on the defensive in Dublin in the immediate aftermath of Bloody Sunday because the British clamp down very hard and the IRA lose a lot of, of, their, of their best people both to death and imprisonment. But on the other hand, in Britain, it provokes a serious reappraisal of whether or not it's possible to keep the situation under control and therefore more far-seeing elements in the British establishment and civil servants like Mark Sturgis realise that you're going to have to put out feelers and talk to these people eventually. Bloody Sunday was a pivotal moment in what was now clearly a guerrilla war and debunked the notion that the end was in sight. There was also a strong fear that Collins and his squad could carry out similar attacks at the heart of British government. Would the next procession of coffins be through the streets of London? In episode two, the British create a martyr. Whilst I'm a bitter opponent of capital punishment, I understand why in 1920 it was the appropriate action to take against Barry. World opinion turns against Britain. Anti-British feeling in Irish America was like fizz in a sort of bottle. Both sides eventually realise that this is a war that they can't win by force alone. But who blinks first? Not a republic. Always not a republic in name only, because that is too much of a humiliation for the British Empire. 